White people are sick fucks, eh? Man, white people are so fucking sick. So fucking sick. So fucking sick. What a sick race. Your Jesus means asshole, by the way. The Son of God means shit. Really means shit. The ass of God. The language of shit is literally bullshit. That's what Jesus is. Literally feces. Right? The idea of talking shit. That's what God does. He talks shit all the time. He talks shit over the whole universe. It's all kept by God's shit-talking asshole, Jesus Christ. The Son of God is the ass of God. He keeps God's ass up. Monday's ass day. Right? Saturday. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday both refer to shit and, and waste product. Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. It's all a perversion. I've already had two young girls stalking me. The only two on the beach, besides myself, because of course they had to stalk me. I don't think white people realize how much they stalk. It's a uh, part of their culture. White people understand if you explain it to them, but they don't really think about it. It's like, women get a pass. Women get to stalk, especially more than men do. If you change the genders and the vaginas for penises, suddenly women would be aghast at it. If two grown men were out there looking at a 13-year-old girl walking and staring at them the same way, you would see they would think they were perverts. White people are very empty. I love it, they got it. Beautiful landscape, clouds, mountains. So I'm starting pretty early today. I'm going to try to take it slow, but we'll see how it goes. A little humid. I think it's the sun is gonna break out today at some point. That's what the weather sort of says. But. <sighs> I stopped right before the Eagle Stronghold. But I do want to talk a lot of today about white violence and history and try to understand it a bit better why white people are all psychopaths. Not if, but why. What do we mean by that? How does TV factor into it? How does the language that TV is speaking to us, that media is speaking to us, which is the language of the number two and the language of at the ass. It's an ass-based language. It keeps its assets.
How white people scapegoat people. They don't often blame the person that makes a mistake in a situation. White people will blame, hopefully, somebody else. They want to blame the innocent person. But the most innocent person is the easiest person to get away with hurting and blaming for something. That's why Jesus is a mentor for Christians. It's for scapegoating the most innocent person. Christians are repeating and loving a program for being homicidal maniacs. So they're passing the buck. They're passing the buck onto an innocent man, and they worship and they drink his blood and eat his body. And it's a perversion. Jesus Christ, everything with Christianity is a perversion. It's all a perversion. They're perverts. And the thing about humans, you know, is that, you know, everyone, as humans, we actually are such amazing, glorious human beings that Christians put their faith into this, and I don't, I don't presume they know what they're not like, oh, I'm worshiping a perversion, ha, ha, ha. But it's hard not to be critical of the fact that they never notice. They don't have any other choice, you see. You have to look at it circumstantially. It's the only religion they have. It's all they've known their entire life. And like TV, its fundamental language remains unknown to them. We can't hold people responsible for what a language is able to do to someone by bypassing their conscious mind. It's witchcraft. So we can't blame Christians. We can't blame Jesus. We can maybe blame ourselves. We can't blame white people. And be... <sighs> Tide's going out right now. be out all day. So when, when uh, what's his name, Danny Caruso waxes on and waxes off, he's waxing his ass. Wax, ass, wax off. To have a heart on is to have a hard ass. To have a vagina. Is to have an ass, an know. The va being the product of the ass, which would be waste products. So the vagina and the penis are conflated with the ass, which is the organ for the delivery and the, of waste products, the production of debt or sin, right? And God commands the jurisdiction over the entire language and collects all of his debts because he has created them. He has made the language, the language is his, and he loans everything that the, the language owns. It is a cost, the cost of doing God's business. The universe is the cost of doing God's business. He literally craps money. He has the Midas touch, which is the middle of the ass, where you find the mon eye, or the eye of the ass. Right, money has the Midas touch. It ties everything to gold, which we owe, and gold means death, or AU. Prison, death, gold, the yellow brick road, every stone is the death of the sun. It begins by the death of the wicked witch of the west, while set is the setting sun is death.
takes the red shoes of sacrifice, the ruby slippers of Cinderella. And they don't fit on her feet. Because whoever's feet they fell off on, they probably didn't fit properly. Or they were stolen from a dead body. So if they fit on her feet, they couldn't possibly be hers. So Cinderella is a liar. People say if the shoe fits when associating a scapegoat, right? If you can frame somebody, if the shoe fits. All these nasty phrases in the English language. Nasty. My dad is a good example of a white person. You know, you can find some compassionate sort of aspects to it, of course, but I mean, it's hard to do it all at once. I mean, my dad has a pretty ludicrous association with honor and the truth. The truth has never really done my dad any good. The truth doesn't work for him. The truth doesn't, doesn't make him look good. So. But he worships Jesus Christ. I never quite understood my dad's relationship with God. I, I suspect that it really wasn't much of any relationship at all, quite frankly. Then I could say that about any Christian. Claims to have some wonderful connection to the Almighty. What's interesting, I've watched white people, you know, and Christians, and they'll sit down with you and they'll talk. This one Christian talked to me for like several hours straight and then several more hours over coffee, and it just never stopped. And it's like you don't even need to say anything. They're like used car salesmen. They, don't, they can't really have conversations. They can't have embodied interactions. It's like they're, oh, look at the otter. Every creature has its place, you know. Oh, there's a phrase. I haven't seen any ravens today. Now we have otter magic. 
magic of the feminine. Was like an otter for a second. Big otter medicine today. It's like a lot to the ocean. Look at them. <coughs> I'm trying not to look at them too much. They're like, they're way out there now. I want to see them slip into the ocean. It's kind of cool. I love sharing you with these other creatures. They're so majestic. Where else to go? Have a nice swim. Imagine what their eyes can see under there. I mean, just think about how many fictional characters we've watched die on movies and television. I'm always astounded when I watch YouTube clips of people dying, fictional characters dying, anyway. And the thousands and thousands of comments talk about how wonderful the performance was by the killer protagonist, and, you know, and how happy they are with how they disemboweled somebody. Even Superman has to count coup, and white people think that of counting coup like vengeance, right? Vengeance, all about vengeance. Like someone did something to me, I gotta do something to them, and I'm just not gonna feel right with myself. Well, you know, here's news to you: when you when you experience bad things from other people, you're not supposed to feel good. You know, the person themselves don't know how fucked up you are about it, right? And a decent person has a radio. Hi would be fucked up about it. I mean, of course, every person, unless you're fucking Jesus Christ, who is a fictional fucking character, you're going to be upset at injustice, right? I criticize humans or criticize white people, but everything that needs to get done in the world needs humans to do it. From getting my coffee to me, to this camera, to my socks, to my clothes, everything. So I also think, in deference to the white man and his compulsions that people need to be able to allow to fuck up. They need to be allowed to get drunk. We, we seem to allow them to get drunk and kill people on the road like three million times a year. It's a wonder we, li we live as long as we do. But I will say this, for all my tired, angry opinions of the white man and his psychopathic religion of death, and it pretty much sums up my entire videos, and that's what I spend my time thinking about. That's right. The word money means ass I. Mon is ass. I guess I could preface all these things by saying, this is what I think it means, so that you don't like you know freak out about it. But I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things, and I think I've figured out what they mean. M-O-N means ass 
I look at how it, just like you would discover a code and you look at how words are being used and what they do. And as crazy as it sounds, the English language is ass-based. It's based on waste products. We have a taste for waste, as it turns out, you know, it's like, you know, your mother's, you know, when I was young, she said, clean your mouth out with soap. And it's like, they're not a soap, there's not enough soap in the world for what once comes across my mouth. I like finding cool new places to sit. Then I can stretch. Oh, I think about the death of my relatives. Like, I honestly, just some of them are so nice. Like, my Uncle Roly, I can't believe they're gone. Bald Eagle. It's probably why there's not as many ravens around. I don't think my knowledge is a perfect knowledge on that account, but I think actually animals coexist quite well. But sometimes I think it's not so much they threaten each other, I think they just maintain certain relative populations, you know? It's not unheard of that as one animal comes around, other animals disappear. I'm not sure exactly how that works. I don't think it's necessarily conflict based. Like, you know, lots of animals. I don't, I've never seen the eagle not get along with other animals, but I don't, when the eagle's flying over, you know, the ducks and stuff tend to swim and fly away. It's almost like signifying the eagle lives in a different realm. Whereas a blue heron can come and sit down among a bunch of geese in the water and the geese don't get disturbed. But if I came down, right? So it's like nature teaches us it's all energy, right? That eagle is teaching us. Thank you, eagle. Letting me know about their presence. It's not that they're, they're like, oh, I'm going to let rain know that I'm here. It's like, the, uh, it has the effect of letting me know. Like, if you use the words, this in nature, this had the effect of making me feel this way, and this had the effect of introducing me to the sun. You know, the sunrise had the effect of letting me know that day was starting. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, the sun is letting me know that they're here. <laughs> like, you know? So, it, what do you, you know, it, it's bullshit, it's lying, it's anthropomorphizing. But you see how the human brain is set to lie to itself. And when I say lying in this sense, I'm talking about like saying things that could even be considered disingenuous, even if they're not meant that way. Like if I say something and it's my opinion and I don't preface it by saying this is my opinion, is that lying? Well, in a way, yes. But I think people who watch my channel know that these are my opinions. That I, when people say, people like me, if I could stereotype myself, say, oh, I believe Jesus is the son of shit, you know, then you know that's my opinion. It's like, no, he is the son of shit. God is shit. He really is shit. It says so right here. <laughs> and so, you know, I think you understand that that's my opinion. I do think I'm right, absolutely. I just, I don't go to bed at night thinking of creepy things to say to people on YouTube. I really think that the English language is ass-based. It is. It's totally ass-based. And I just like, the word mon means ass. So Monday is ass day. Saturday day is turd day. Right? And what is sat? The god of time. Right? And you have seconds? Why do we have seconds for something that's one at a time? No, the eagles die. Why are my nuts a fundamental unit of Western time keeping? How many of my nuts would you like? <laughs> I only have so many to go around. Two, exactly. My, my nuts are the number two. Then you have seconds. Then you have Horus, which has all kinds of interesting derivations and uses like the word horizon. And Horus is really a god of death. He's like Osiris. His father is Set death and his mother is Nut. <coughs> how 
almost sounds like nude. A nude with a newt. What is the eye of a newt? What is Isaac Newton? Isaac. Look at Munai, right, is the eye of the ass. So who is Isaac Newton? What is the eye of the newt? Who is newt? Why do we call showing our ass mooning someone? You ever notice how you call it mooning in the white language? Where did that come from? You probably thought it's because the human ass <coughs> is so much like the moon. <coughs> it has two hats <coughs> and yet it is full. Oh, I'm feeling a bit better. <coughs> I'm feeling 100% this morning. Um, not like a cold, just <coughs> fatigue. And um, why do we call it? Interesting discussions, right? Because the moon and mom is an ass. Look at the Mona Lisa. Isa is the star Sirius. The dog the star. And the dog star and a dog is an aster or an ass or an astra or an actor who is a dead person. So the dog star is a dead dog. And the Mona Lisa is Mona or Aino is an ass or shit. No, ass, the eye of the ass. Mona Lisa, Isa is I. I is Isa, so the eye of the ass. And what is the eye of the ass? The conflation of male and female sex units. The collapse of the basic parts of the physical energy of man into a single unit of, and a waste product. Now you look at the psyche. The psychology really is mon mon money-cology. It's funny how all my psychiatrists, it sounds like I had a lot of them, right? I didn't see a lot of them often, but I had a few at a certain time in my life. So, it, you know, I give, I, I'm able to kind of recall every single meeting I had with them and what they said to me and what they said to other people and how they shared my information with someone who raped and tried to kill me. <laughs> but that's another story. And, uh, I don't know, you could say that psychiatry is awful, you could say that some people can get information out of anyone, or you could say it's just an awful, awful thing to happen, and, you know, we're all very sorry for your reign, but, you know, you can't just hate all psychiatry for the rest of your life, and it's like, well, you can watch me, in fact, you can literally watch me, you can come back on my channel, and I will do exactly that, <laughs> <laughs> and I have the right. Hate is an emotion. I have the right to hate psychiatry. I hate them. Don't take that away from me. No, no, no. Don't take that away from me. I don't know any psychiatrists, so like I don't go to their office and throw feces into their face or anything. It's not that kind of hate. I mean, that's that's some kind of hate. I mean, I would applaud you for doing that, but I mean, technically, I think that's against the law. <laughs> you know, they're people too. <laughs> You know, what if, if, you see, then you have to ask, if we were allowed to throw shit in people's faces, then people could throw shit in my face. And I'd be like, hey, you can't do that. It's like, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. We're allowed to do that now. You said so. <laughs> You're like, okay, I want to rethink this. <laughs> um, I forget what I was talking about now. Oh, yeah, they were always telling me I had to go get money, go and get a job. That was the solution to all my problems, which is, you know, I'll pass that on to you. Like, work does fill the void. But once they did that, you see, every time they did that, they set up a comparison, a correlation or comparison between solutions to issues involving every type of abuse, including dislocated body parts that I'd suffered at that point, right? Right, and all medical considerations and possible resolutions and due care and kindness for all of the, like when a person is raped or traumatized, they can't control how they feel and they need help, right? Would you agree? Check, check, okay. They need empathy and understanding. Okay, check. What did I get? Go get a job. And so it set up a correlation between working and all of these health-related issues being solved. It, so it, it commerces with them. 
They said it's a Bacomus. That working and earning money is the solution to any problem that you could go to a psychiatrist for. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm still thinking about that. It does set up quite a relationship, eh? Who are psychiatrists? Are they occupational therapists? Is that it? Do they work for the employment centers of the world? I didn't realize that therapy and the realm of money and earning money were like the same thing. I thought it was actually talking about my feelings, and they would tell me to shut up. Every therapist I've gone to does not want to talk about my fucking feelings. They tell me to swallow them so I can be more of a man. That's just the ones I've met. I mean, they're out there going, there's a woman out there going, I would never do that to you. I would just charge you $300 and I would never say a word and I would just listen to you. In fact, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> it's like, imagine me having to pay to do this. I have to pay some woman on the internet for doing this. It's like, I'm listening to you and it takes work. Oh, little dear. Holy cow. I thought it was a, like a woman standing up. And I was going to go, sorry. <laughs> There's a female deer coming. Oh, that's so cool. See, these are the lucky moments. Just to be quiet. Hey. Something is unquiet, you know. Oh, they're just looking for leaves to eat. Hmm? The initial meeting is over. I feel comfortable now. So they have such a nice way about them. This deer, the way this deer is coming along here, approaching me, so to speak, uh, or coming in my direction, that's how you therapists should approach your patients, like a deer. You should be a deer, you know? Be a deer and approach me like a deer. Hi. Why should I pay to something I can do on my own YouTube channel? So, I guess I should, I should also add, though it may for some people go without saving, I, I actually wasn't able to really act on that wisdom of getting a job to deal with all of my abuse issues. But it's interesting then that not able to do so means that anything else that I experience is my fault. If it's such a helpful, positive solution, then if I can't do it, I'm pretty much fucked, right? There are no other solutions. This is it. They show you the door. I want people to understand that it's really good that happened to me. Because I know that probably most of your therapy doesn't go that way. It just went that day with me because they tested my IQ. You see, and they were intimidated by my intelligence. Not that I'm some like ferociously intellectual movie like Hanna like you know it's interesting how I pick a serial killer, Hannibal Hannibal, but I mean how many smart people do you know in movies that aren't like evil villains? <laughs> you know? Can't think of them. <laughs> you know? The villain in Bond is smarter than Bond is. That's the idea, but he's always on the winning side, right? You don't want to be like those smart people. <laughs> you know? Cool people who can fuck whenever they want and have a license to kill. You can just eventually put a bullet in their head and make some pithy comment and then die and leave their children with a legend smoking like a gun over the horizon. There's a baby. following the way the mother went.
I like how the pace at which they're day unfold. <coughs> it's a nice pace out here. I just felt a note of menace in there, so I just stopped for a second. I thought I heard a white person's voice. That's okay. Um, because compared to this scene around here, like white people can be, if you know, a little boisterous for me. To be fair, I'm talking about like subjectively how a world that isn't supposed to really think much about my feelings whatsoever feels to me when I return to it at the end of the day, you know. And that's what I mean. That's, I guess the therapist would say like, no, Ryan, when you say that you think that all white people are just acculturated to being precisely the type of person that see people like you should be the most afraid of. Are you really saying that you're just very insecure and you don't know how to move forward in life? And perhaps in deference to the answer to which question, which we all know is yes, I have devised a list of things that you might want to try to learn to be a real person and get a job. <laughs> Why would I pay for that? Why? It's with someone over 200 IQ. Why would I sit there and pay 100 or $300 an hour? And if you're out there and you're a psychiatrist and you're a smart person, you're, you're laughing with me at this point. Like, why the fuck would I do that? I'm a reasonable person, okay? Right? Why don't you go out there and fucking go play with the fucking whales? Why don't you do that? <laughs> why don't you go climb a tree? Why don't you go find a tree in Central Park and climb it naked and urinate on a police officer? You know? <laughs> why don't you? Really, we could ask anything. Why don't you chop up, chop up your own balls and send them to the Pentagon? You know, like, why don't you? Because it's crazy. You don't want to. It doesn't make sense. It's not the right moment for that. <laughs> the time has not come. <laughs> There's not enough beer in the world. What? Right? What do you want me to say? <laughs> I'm having trouble being around you. And you want me to go somewhere where I'm around people even worse than you all day long? Telling me all my life, whether at work or at school, you always have that white person leaning in and telling you who you are and how they know what kind of person you really are. <laughs> and it's like, you're giving it energy and you're more complicated than you think. Or you're scared of girls. <laughs> or you're not, you're not in your body. <laughs> it's like, you're not, you're not even in your body, man. That's your problem, or you're totally in the moment. You've been in the moment for a long time, haven't you? <laughs> you know, I just, I could give you phrase after phrase of white people just giving me unsolicited, you know, high and low you know, uh, summations of who I am as a person, none of whom would ever and did ever get to know a single fucking thing about me. Oh, the deer are coming and looking for her. Hi, hi. I think she knows me. I think this one has just gotten older. They've lost their spots now. They age so quickly. Well, a month or two. You see how clean that realm is? The deer very clean animals, the trails are always really nice. They're very well manicured just from use. That's why I like them. You can take the deer trails back there up and down the coast. I mean, they're difficult at times, but they're for deer, they're not for men, right? And you will understand your decision to walk on them. It's not that they're gonna be good or useful or even safe for a human, but nonetheless, they're very well groomed. It's fun to see I'll often come to a place where it's like, wow, you know, like, I can't go where they do. You know, they, they have skill that I don't have. They can go places I can't go. They have lives I don't totally relate to, maybe. And yet they're so peaceful and they, they share such good medicine with me. Today I came out here and I had a feeling of evil in the air. That I often get from this town, although I came out fairly quickly. 
I went to the gas station I don't really like, and I got some drinks. The guy was like nice, but you know, I just I feel always feels like the place is a bit hinky. You know, I got a good deal on my drinks, but I'll go back to the general store the next day because I just it's nice and that's good, and I want to do that like once a month, come in there, have a nice experience, and leave. I just don't get the feeling, and I'm learning in life that there are places that I should just be thinking about going on a fairly regular basis, <laughs> and that place is one of them. But uh, it's getting better over time. But I was having fantasies like, oh, I'll just go to the, because it's right near my house, and I'll just go out to the beach and I'll have a really easy August. But it's like, no, you're not going to get any exercise. And the, the nature, the deer, they cut the evil. They do cut evil down quite a bit. You want to cut evil down to size and you're having a bad day? Think of the deer medicine. The deer medicine, deer are my therapist. Whatever's going on in my life, they're my, the compassion of the female for these, just going, I can just, you know, hear my mother going, that's okay, that's okay, and, you know, you're angry, you know, you have a right to be angry, my lord, you know, my lady, you have a right to be angry, who out there, what, what lord or lady who's out there in the wilds of the world, who has experienced, I don't know, some kind of psychopathic fucking trauma of some kind from who knows, the human race, aka the white man, <laughs> The AKA 47. Uh, <laughs> number 11. Hey, peace out. Um, the 7 11. The endless universe of the number 2. I wouldn't be surprised if heaven was just a giant asshole swimming with waste products in the English language. Why not? I mean, you go to the toilet, you say you're sitting on the throne. Where's the throne? In heaven. Think about it. If you're sitting on the throne in heaven, where is your own feces going? You're creating the whole world. There was one weird psychology book I read that said that the production of feces for children represents the primeval creative act. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. That it is like a base creative act. And then lying can be likened unto it as well. For a child or an adult, lying and taking a shit are like fundamental creative acts. I tell you the truth, let's just take them separately for a second. Like taking a crop is a creative act. Like you might think that's silly, but that was a very important thing for me to read. Think just take a moment to think about that. And now I realize like that if you take that if you really start to resonate with that at all, that it, it would probably it could for some people make them more interested in what I'm saying which already sounds pretty freaky so I don't want to manipulate you through your asshole and the pleasure you take in using it for what God intended <laughs> so silly. because that's what you're doing you're using it for what God intended you know? just a little little double entendre <laughs> God's intentions are like good intentions, right? <clears throat> it's an interesting language, right? Whereas, like, every language is a God, and God is the God of the English language. So, what are God's intentions, and what are good, good intentions in relation to God, or in relation to the English language? And you see a kind of triangulation there. Right? And you think, I'm wasting your time. I think, if anything, God is only a partial God of the English language. Because the English language is really just, a, like, English people, English thinking, it's just a very partial view of the universe. Right? That's attained by being under a kind of pressure that has absolutely probably had a huge regulating power and given, who knows, millions of people opportunities and happiness and lives aplenty that we would not want to disturb in any way or detract from the honors thereof. A high pressure way of going about doing the stuff of man in the structures that man has devised for himself in a total anthropological sense. Because not every culture like the animals moves as fast as we do. A language like a people live under certain types of pressure 
and the language, if it is true to the people, should tell us about the pressure they live under, right? Should tell us about what kind of animal they are. Nature, if nothing else, always has information, so the truth will always out. The language is a group of sound that immersed in which and the, the tones and effects and impacts on and from out this body or this other imaginary body that people serve even at the cost of their own bodies and even in the name of their love. How is that possible? You know, the stuff we learn in, in history in elementary school is already more advanced. It's already more sophisticated and more complicated than this. This is actually fundamental to that. Looking at language and the human mind, much less the study of history. Or economics. This is the type of education children should get for the first 12 to 13 years of their life. While they're in touch with their emotions and their heart, if encouraged in an appropriate environment, most likely. You know? And uh, just think about how in touch children are with nature and their emotions and their hearts under all the appropriate circumstances, of course. Right? As soon as you start saying something good about children, you know, this world will find a million ways to exploit it, won't we? I mean, it's just exploitation is just in our blood. So, with respect to the world's children, you know. I'm going to make, make some generalizations that children can learn in a sophisticated enough philosophy. Forget education and how to teach children. Just a sophisticated way of thinking. Children can learn. If that's really great, they will have no trouble learning it because it will be fundamental to someone who's able to feel it and to include their feelings in their heart and their sense of loyalty to, the, to their, lo their heart's first love. The world, the f their mother, their father, themselves today. In fact, a child, of course, should be accepted in that. Why would they ever think, why would they think that there was even a concept of not loving everything and everyone? Not that children aren't very discriminating in who they do and do not love or trust or fear and all those things. I don't, but any, no one wishes to saddle children with any inability to just not know how not to love. Right? I don't know if that was too many double negatives or not. It is not even an appropriate term, maybe, in terms of the language and development of children. Outside of the fact that, of course, their parents love them, and of course they love their parents, but we're all, uh, along the way, every family is learning what love really is, right? If nothing else, we're, we're, we're humble enough to know that we're thankful for the love that we have, we're thankful for the people in our lives, but we're also learning about what love is. We're learning to be true to our nature. People every day are looking for healing that is in every sense going to be connected to their nature and learning how to treat it properly in a world that hasn't learning how to develop subtle form subtle bodies subtle forms of your own emotional language that the world has in a way if not discouraged never particularly nourished in you and for all you know you're the only person who has a problem with that you're this is getting into subtleties that make every person the greatest possible minority in human history minority of one times a billion the fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the person you never get to be and the things you never get to say and the feelings you never get to cultivate and find in your way something that resonates with a certain kind of knowing in the world a certain kind of wonderful knowing about your world and a poem you can sing a song you can sing something you can paint or just a way you can resonate with the world when you're in your sacred place. And art can be sacred. Your art can be your spirituality, your religion. It can be your job. In my life, I combine my art, my spirituality, and my job, and my therapy into the same thing every day. Now, of course, I had to. What else would I do? You might say. You could pathologize me, or you could say, hey, that was a good choice. It's not a common choice, but it's not stupid either. Sounds interesting. To be fair, most people wouldn't be interested in talking to me this much. But. And one of the reasons, well, I, is I wouldn't have to talk like this to most people anyway, because, you know, everyone kind of already understands that in a way. That's who people are. I mean, that's who we are, really. 
if we're having a sacred time with someone, we're, we're the people we are. We bring to them, out of our heart, the person we've always been. And there may be many things we don't feel we need to share with them. And that also makes our heart feel good. We don't have to tell them how wonderful and sacred our time on earth means so much to us that we hope it means so much to them too. And they're not going to look at us and say, because of some such thing you can't control about your life, I, I, I'm, not ever going to, I'm never going to find anything as interesting about your life as you do. And how cold that can feel. If someone doesn't speak your language, and, but now they're close, and maybe you're very agreeable, and maybe your body, just as an animal, feels things that later you will reflect upon quite keenly, that you are, you know, this person is never going to want to know you, that they don't know that, and they may not even know why you pull back from them in some way. Why are you resisting? That's the moment of tension. That's the critical moment right there. For me, as a victim of sorts, to someone who finds people quite tiring. I often think to myself, it's amazing what people throughout my life, white people complain about and what they never complain about and never see. In proportion to, you know, what little we complain about, some of us in life, and how people respond to that as though we've just been a menace to society. How many things can I talk about that a million people keep quiet to themselves every day? Busy sewing or taking care of people or going to their job or riding on some lonesome bus another lonesome day to come home to another lonesome home. Their mommy and daddy will never be there for them again. And they're all alone in the world. You know, cracking open their bacon potato or just making some rice or some pasta. And when they open the cupboards, no one has stopped them. Their favorite peanut butter. But you're proud, or they're proud. You take care of yourself now. You're the only one you've got left. You look in the mirror and say, it's just you, man. It's just you and me. Us versus the world. No one's gonna give anything away. We're going to have to go and earn it. You're going to be somebody, or are you going to be nobody? And I chose nobody. You know? I looked at my face in the mirror the first time my dad punched me, red and swollen. I looked in the same mirror where my face looked like a burn victim with pus coming out of every pore. And I accepted what I was. A freak. So when I went to psychiatrists and, you know, and they would treat me differently because whether they took my IQ or not. And they never get around to telling you anything good about you that relates to how you make them feel. Because you know that our culture isn't like that. No, no one of them can look back at you with some kind of honor. I mean, here I am, vulnerable young man. I'm not posturing. I'm not sitting here like Jason, Jason Bourne in Good Will Hunting, going, "Okay, ask me something about myself that I don't like. See what happens." <laughs> huh? No, I've been around people throughout my life, like when you go to therapy, who have a very vulnerable person before them. They can do whatever they want. It's their place. It's the therapist's office. That's your territory. You tell me what you want me to do. You show me how to feel comfortable. And they can't do it. You look me in the eyes and tell me that you're an honest man. You tell me you're not going to hurt me or disrespect me or my heritage. You tell me you're ready to do some real fucking therapy. You look at me like a general looks to a soldier and says, Follow me. I've got this. And you can't fucking do that. 
right? And I know you can't do that, and you fucking know you can't do it. Every fucking one of you knows you can't do it, all right? And no one's taking your beautiful little certificates away and your important little job in the world, right? Go write some paper that I want to read. Go do something useful with your so-called education. I mean, Jesus Christ, you got one life, man. Can't be a douche for all of it. You know, you're going to offer someone some help? You fucking get some competence on you then. You know? So, like, get to the level of, like, that Dr. Phil dude. Forensic psychiatrist, whatever, criminologist. Man. Whether it's a bit of an act or whatever it is, that's what I'm talking There's someone who will just lean, if he has to lean in, which I'm guessing he wouldn't because he's not a psychopath. It would be interesting to watch his body language. And I don't think he's a leaner. I mean, they sit in stools, right? So he can lean in to emphasize it like that. But at the same time, you got a good distance around him. And he'd be like, hey, Rain, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm going to tell you like it is. I'm not going to pussyfoot around all your little fancy phrases and put out all the little fires you're lighting by disinhibiting anyone from thinking that they're more intelligent than you are. Because I'll tell you something. This ain't my first rodeo. Wait a second. I knew that already. Ask me again. And guess what? It's not your first rodeo. That's right. <laughs> you see? I got it down. <laughs> not your first rodeo. I like that, how it's simple and it totally explains who you are. Not your first rodeo. Who am I in that rodeo, Dr. Phil? Oh, now, now, you're just playing little word games and I'm not going to play verbal footsies with you, okay? We're, we're, we're dealing with some serious things. These people out behind those cameras, they want to know what kind of penny whistle I need to pull out of your ass to, to get you acting like a, a normal American, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guess it's not your first rodeo, right? Okay, so who am I in that rodeo? I just, if, am I allowed to ask questions? <laughs> Uh, you're too smart for that, Rain. You don't need to know if it's who's who at the rodeo. <laughs> Maybe I'm just selling a hot dog or two. What do you care? <laughs> I mean, who? okay, let's ask another question. Who are you at the rodeo? <laughs> are, you the, are you the forensic psychiatrist at the rodeo? In which case, I mean... <laughs> A rodeo is a competitive environment, isn't it? Where wild or broken animals are used to torture and entertain people. Kind of like killing the bull in the center of the ring. Angry bulls, angry beasts, excited angry people with sugar and alcohol coursing through their veins. Is, is that the rodeo that you're talking about? I can see why a psychiatrist might go to the rodeo. But you're saying this is not your first rodeo, so you're saying that this relationship is also a rodeo. And you, I'm taking it you run the rodeo, so you're like the owner of the whole rodeo situation. You own the stadium, right? You're the one who buys and sells the tickets, and you decide what's real. You decide how everything happens and whether or not someone is sufficiently sporting, given that the rodeo really is considered a very popular place. Millions of people go there. They make billions of dollars. So, I mean, you know, it must be an extraordinary thing. If I wasn't inclined to enjoy the rodeo, um, then uh, maybe you could help me with that. I don't enjoy the torture of animals. Entertaining as it is, I've watched lots of shows where they have rodeos, and, you know, there's just so much subtle torture of animals in this world. I just... Uh, and they make it sound like the animals are meant to do this. This is their life's work. You know? you know, it's like you might as well do the same thing to your children. They're working in the mine. It's like, hey, don't take me away from this. It's what I was meant to do. That would be cruel to take me out of the mine, because all horses, of course, want to be part of the rodeo. You don't think some of them maybe want to just go and wander wild somewhere and let children ride on them or something? That sounds a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> Eat grass and, you know, 
You can't, you can't say anything about children in this world anymore. People are so sick. <laughs> Gotta be careful. Yeah. Enough with the children. <laughs> anyway, just wander and eat clover or something. You know? These geese, do you think any of them want to go to the rodeo? you think the eagles want to go to an eagle rodeo, Dr. Phil? You ever gone to an eagle rodeo? I mean, tell me. How could this relationship be something that isn't a rodeo and isn't something, anything that you've been to before? It could be like a fresh thing. And then you could have like a fresh start on life, having a real conversation with another human being. Who's not like some stupid American idiot who just believes every fucking thing that comes out of your pie hole. You know, as entertaining as it is. And I don't doubt that Dr. Phil is a real psychologist and has a real job and is highly respected in his field. I'm just saying, I just know Dr. Phil, the entertainer. <laughs> That's important, right? And, and you know, the TV psychologist, right? And uh, it would be great in some cases, like when he, he gives families like total all paid treatment for drug addiction and family therapy. Like, I'm always like, yo, dude, like you've just done your life's work right there. Um, take nothing away from that. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that's really what everyone gets. Everyone should get that. You should start a bill. You know, every family with drug addiction gets, like, paid therapy so their, their child, their loved one with any type of drug or alcohol addiction can get all of the help and the family can get all the help they need to heal. Now, if one of the parents or, you know, or someone in the family is just a flat-out criminal psychopath or just... You know, their whole way of being is like making your whole way of being just want to kill itself. Then we can deal with that too. And imagine how many families who quietly listen to this announcement on their TVs and their iPhones and just go, huh. we'll be sending literature this week to every household in the world. We're going to get there, America, because you've been working hard and you deserve decent family therapy. Right? Right, we all do. It's there, it's available. Our governments are probably just scared of insulting us because they know how fucked up how many people are and they don't want to start raining all kinds of help upon like millions of families, most of whom are cooking. And there's nothing wrong with us. Oh no, our family's fine. Leave us alone. <laughs> Silly. But I'm glad, I'm glad the people who need it are getting the help they need, right honey? Uh huh. Because we weren't affected by the war or anything. We were dutiful citizens, because really, those people are still just being very dutiful citizens. And they need, they need to be respected too, right? There are people who that, that think that's stupid. That's not us. And, they, you know, it's not that they're kind of also advertising that, obviously, it is you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all of us. But that's okay. You know, that's your thing. You know, and you need that. And we'll, we'll understand and attend to that properly by leaving you out alone. <laughs> Pretty soon when we're having a lot of fun and all our families are healed and you're like, my heart feels like coal, honey. <laughs> and he's like, could you empty my colostomy bag again, honey? Because <laughs> <coughs> people will go through, and their brains will go to uh, into an operation where they will go through any amount of physical, almost like deliriously boring in lifeless and loveless lives and homes and marriages without ever complaining about it. And G.I. Jane, he says that, you know, a bird will fall, will freeze and fall dead upon the bow without ever complaining, without fe ever feeling sorry for itself. And we sell this heroic quality in nature. You see how sickening that is in a way, right? In a way, like, it's talking about death. It's like something that can slowly freeze you. Do you see a lot of frozen birds? Or do you see a lot of frozen people? What about our elders? Our revered elders. They've seen a few things, haven't they? As the saying goes. 
I don't think I probably say very much that's appealing to people born before 1980 or 1970. <laughs> but uh, I live in the world too. I have feelings. I have my opinions. And they would respect that. There's a lot of nice old people out there, you know. They probably wouldn't watch my channel because it's quite silly, frankly, in, in many ways. Smart, as it is. But, you know, I don't mind that it being taken that way. I mean, it's obviously not just that way to me. You know, but, uh, but just because I find it sacred doesn't mean someone's not allowed to find it silly and a waste of their time. Right? That's, that's just... When you do anything in public, you know, you have to allow people to have their feelings about it. You can't. Yeah, otherwise, I should just not make videos, would I? And then no one would know, and I wouldn't have to worry about what they thought. Anyway. Um, I don't think most revered elders would want to watch it, but I, I don't think they would say, they would be like, oh, I don't hold, you know, he sounds like an honest man. Telling you his mind, telling the world what's on his mind, and you like they respect that. But that fellow has a lot on his mind. What's he jibber jabbering about today? Something about the ass of God, crap, and money. <laughs> I tell you, the children today, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say. I would tell you what nature told me one day when I was walking with a six foot five beautiful Canadian indigenous man. I didn't call him that. I called him an Indian, but <laughs> sometimes I referred to him as a dog, but in a very affectionate way. He came from, he comes from, I should say, the dog, I don't know him anymore, the dog rib tribe in northern Canada. I call it the dog rib tribe because I don't know the native words for it, but he told me the story of his tribe, you know, how, how close they've been with dogs for how long, the relationship they have with them, and he would always lead me on all these trails, and I said once or twice, and he was like this incredible, faithful animal dog, man. in a way that, you know, he understood that I wasn't disrespecting him, I was respecting the culture, like, I've never been around a person that actually in itself made me respect both people and animals more so much as being around with this man. I mean, like the spirit of the dog, he introduced me to all the wonderful medicines of the earth. Like, it's only the most high and wonderful medicine of the dog. <coughs> I mean, he, he was an ambassador of nature. <coughs> nature. It shows you that native people of all kinds, their relationship to the earth and animals and their people brings with it like that in, in parlance you'd call it a technology or a magic or a, you know a panache or something and it's like it's like oh what is it about him <laughs> Ooh, you know or they get sexually aroused it's like for me it's just honoring his medicine he could fuck white people anytime he could basically pick any girl in a bar he's tremendously good looking or man for that matter good looking bisexual but we didn't have that kind of relationship. It was different. He knew I respected him. I fully respected him. And I don't think you really want to have sex with people you respect. We were playing in the ocean one day, and he's this amazingly living person. He's this beautiful guy, and we were playing and just jumping around in the ocean a little bit. And I think I said something like... Uh, Sometimes I, I wish I was gay, man. <laughs> Make me wish I was gay. You know, <laughs> this would be a, you know, this would be a better life somehow. <laughs> Just be so much easier for me <laughs> if I was gay. It's like, like, you know, I like hanging out with you. <laughs> it's not something you should usually say to a man. And the only thing is, I, I could say that to him because he was technically, you know, gay. So, but he knew I wasn't. But it's like. I can tell you, because I swam naked with him sometimes, he had a huge penis, beautiful penis. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was gifted, he's gifted, he's been endowed very well. 
my god, I, mean, I can't imagine what a woman would do if he came out of the water naked with nothing but a bandana on his head. I just tell you, fuck. It's like, uh, talk about a hot dog vendor. <laughs> you could put mustard in one hand and ketchup in the other. <laughs> it's not funny, and I don't mean any of this. I don't, you know, but uh, beautiful man. You know, man, put me to shame. I felt a little less that day. <laughs> I looked down at my shriveled little turtle and I thought to myself, we'll have better days, my little friend. <laughs> it's okay. It's his turn to shine. You know. Look at him. He's like the sun. Yes, and the little shriveled pin's like, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> it was cold out, too. This guy's coming out of like a near freezing lake with his huge jaw. <laughs> I said to him once day, I said to my dad, it's like, I. I think you're a grower, not a show. <laughs> he was not happy with that. It's like that's where I, where I went too far. I was like, oh. <laughs> it must have come off as pretty passive aggressive. I guess I didn't mean that. But I meant you have a huge, beautiful penis, but. Or maybe you shouldn't, you know, put your penis in my face, you know? There's that too, you know? Little quid pro quo. <laughs> quid pro quo, no penis, no penis, oh, amano. <laughs> Ixnay on the enus pay. <laughs> enus pay. Hmm. Enus, Enus Pay. You look at the letter P, which I think means vagina in the rune, and that the word sign comes out of penis. Signs come out of the vagina. The science of life. The signs of life. The signs and the science of life, which is perfect. I guess you could say that Mother Nature's science would be man's science. I said before that God only has a partial ownership of the world, even the English language. The full ownership really would be a mother, wouldn't it? How could anything but a mother be ultimately the owner of the world and of her own body? Her own justice system and governments. What but a mother could own the entire world? Have mercy on me, my mother. Let's be called in the rune. That's pretty auspicious. And another one. It's supposed to be warmer today. It doesn't feel like it right now. Stale, stale, low, low, quack, 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 singing this. Chica, 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 jack, singing this. Chica, chica, low, 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 low. Stel, stel, lova, quack, 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 singing this cheek, 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 jack, singing this cheek, cheek, lova, 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 lova. I like being irreverent towards celebrities. I like Dr. Phil. I actually do. I just, it's a good example. Like, I think, you know. Well, I obviously don't completely like Dr. Phil. <laughs> Dr. Phil doesn't feel like I like Dr. Phil, but it's like, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to watch the shows, and I never really wanted to watch them, but I like the ones where he healed, helped to heal families with drug addiction and stuff. But other than that, you know. 
you know, it, he's an easy person to listen to talk to. He seems pretty confident, and you know, he seems pretty fair. You know, he's fair-minded. He's not an abusive person. You, know? you don't get the feeling he would use power over someone or I mean, manipulate a patient or something like that. So I think that the therapeutic environment and what kind of led into my irreverent and somewhat scathing parody of Dr. Phil. But I think it's also kind of enlightening, really, not, not so much even because of Dr. Phil, who distinguishes himself from multiple fields and disciplines. Um, and he's rich, and he can, you know, sue me for slander. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know that kind of thing. That means that ignorance is no defense, even if, like, you know, you don't know you're being a cunt. But, um, is that, like, you know, what I, and I think people at this point understand my credibility or lack thereof, and, you know, it's just a man and his opinions, but, like, the therapeutic environment, which is also kind of like the cultural environment, or, I mean, we're all so liberal in the Western world, like, we, we think we're not touched by religion, but our whole language is still a religion. It, it might need to be treated that way if people are going to be properly treated. You know what I mean? It's like some strange alcoholic family. Like, let's just admit that being a white person in the English language is like a total religion and or a play on words with the human asshole, right? Let's just, you know, put that together, all right? Come on, clap your hands. It's okay. You can do it. Just, yep, yep. Even if you don't understand, just, just bow your head. <laughs> because, you know, now we can all move on. Like, it's just, you know, and like any religion, you can make it what you want. It's not a religion that you see with all this liberality in the Western world. It's the one religion you actually don't have a choice and you can't get out of. It's the cult that everybody's in. It's the religions everyone everyone's in. And it's the culture that you have a reason to be proud of all at the same time. This culture, this amazing free liberal culture has come at a cost. It, it's like a Frankenstein monster on the one hand with all the forces and magistry and mayhem that goes along into reinforcing certain suggestions through a language that uh, provides like a backdoor to Windows 1 million and 6, a way of talking to the human mind and repeating and teaching it and, and sharing things and signals with it all the time in a way that nobody understands, nobody knows, nobody you know really is analyzing. It, it is a super language, it's like a supernatural language coming through the television. It's like, <laughs> you know, it sounds like something a crackhead would think, but it's like, it is. It doesn't mean that it is supernatural. It doesn't mean that it's this, but it is a language. It's not just a story. It's not just your favorite character, you know, coming out of a coma and marrying her, his, her high school sweetheart. It's not just that. It's never just that, okay? For, for entertainment purposes, absolutely. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. That there's other meanings to it or levels of Congress of the mind doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it, you shouldn't enjoy it. It's not a, it shouldn't be disinhibiting in any way. I don't expect that it would be. I don't think anyone would ever listen to me and go, oh wow, I'm going to stop watching TV. That would be pretty stupid, right? <laughs> be like, you know, that, didn't, that wouldn't be like a very intelligent response. It might be better to just try to be more astute when you're watching. Anyone can. It's like you can start looking at Teslas or cars or, you know, certain weather reports. You can just start noticing things. Use the pause button. Let it be your best friend. You know, just try to find little hidden plots and seams and statements and little epiphanies moving from scene to scene and character and character. They can be found. I find them more by accident. I drift over them like people hover over cross crosswords. I, I look at and connect in my brain. Since it's talking to my brain, and in a sense irritating it, my brain can talk back. My brain is like, poof, poof, oh, oh, I just got what you said to me there. Oh, wow, you just said something. Oh, wow, look at you. You can, right, just like a dream, it says things to us. Oh, wow, you just said this. Oh, wow, you just said that. Because we can lie, we can create, we can take a shit. That's creativity. We can also make meaning out of, and we do. We do uh, in the most all the mon f the ways that we could think are completely frivolous, blah 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 blah, make a meaning out of this, make it like you know, oh I'm gonna this is a nice place I'm gonna make a meaningful little place here today and then it's gone, maybe. Well, it's only here for a little while. This particular place, this particular time, time and place and circumstance and our happiness do tend to kind of drift, don't they?
and yet they carry forth certain meaning and as frivolous as some of that might seem to anyone but myself or someone else they could say it's just a form of lying and you're you know oh yeah I know what you're doing and, you know, you're just making this up as you go along and that's how that person sees that And it could be your job if you spend a lot of time using your time and space like I do to form these thoughts and share them with other people to try to be more astute about how they hear it. Um, step in and explain kind of what you're doing from time to time so they can get a sense of what's happening instead of just being this overwhelming barrage of sounds and words and awful sounding things about white people and Dr. Phil. All I heard is he said Dr. Field and feces and it's not his rodeo and rodeos aren't good and they're hurting horses. They're hurting horses. I can't believe we love the horses. We love them. We take care. If you knew the amount of time we spend taking care and raising and feeding and loving them and giving them names and branding them in the ass, you would just not believe it. <laughs> we give them the best life a horse ever had. <laughs> They eat hay three, four times a day. You should see how much they eat. Yeah. I found that through art and writing and talking that I can access different parts of my mind in a way. Same thing like, you know, reading, playing an instrument, you know, anything that I, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to use all the right words, but it's like anything elating peaceful things, things that we already know and you listen to a peace video or meditation music, you're like, huh, why don't I do this more often? <laughs> you know, it's like, hmm. <laughs> you are relaxing. You're in your special place. The world is fucked. But then again, that's what the world does best. Fuck with you. But you're here. You've got the upper hand. You're not going to let the world fuck with you anymore. You're going to sit and breathe and listen to this voice and know with every breath that all the curses and vipers and threatening pieces of shit in the world are just going to melt away because they can't touch you. You're better than they are. You're Max Headroom and they're Tiny Turner. <laughs> we are going too far off beat you think but no here in our happy place our words can move and whittle and woggle and step upon the toes of many Hollywood screenwriters with their total lack of concern for the intelligence of anyone else but themselves they can indulge they can lose their cool they can take no sufficient heed the many stumbling blocks to the insufficiently disciplined thought, the inappropriately punctuated sentence. No sooner are we children in school but learning how to write properly and how to write the letters and how to do the period and this. And even after 12 years, to be frank, all these teachers don't manage to teach people how to properly write and speak English. And let's just be, you know, just a little round of applause, a little silent. Thank you, teachers of North America. And also, we're sorry, because it isn't really your fault, you know. It's not like you have any control over outcomes. You know, America's just getting stupider, and you just happened to be at the helm while it was happening. You did the best you could, but no one blames a sailor for the whole ship going down because the whole mess of ropes that he was left to hang on to are heavier than he is. You know what I'm saying? There you go. All right, we got our metaphors, our allegories, and we're moving along. That's a period on that, my friends. That's a completely full stop. <laughs> Something our life will never do, but that every sentence must for us to get the thrust of where you're really coming from and where you're really going. But most of all, st stopping long enough to pay the toll because you got to know when to tax them, know when to toll them, when and how to tell them how. Never speak again. You gotta hold your breath to cool your porridge. You gotta keep those thoughts inside you. Uh, Cause the teacher don't care. <laughs> they teach you how to write and punctuate. They never let you form your own opinions about anything. No one asked me to use this 
these sounds and these words to say something that had to do with me. It's like you're learning your note. It's like learning any language, French, English. You're never going to, you don't even learn English the way they teach you English in English schools. Because it's like the letters and this and that and all these concepts. And really, the teaching of English in schools tells us why teachers never really teach anything properly. Because really, the, the ABCs is the basis, right? You could be teaching children logic. You can let them maximize their feeling nature as children. There's like a million, million things you could do that I could probably think of a hundred today in the next 15 minutes that teach that it never occurs to them. And it's important to understand that because it can't because it can't, because of how their minds are blocked off by the way they learn how to speak and write English, which actually starts to block off the mind. I think people come out of school and just the way they've learned and not learned English properly has like seriously retarded billions of people at this point. No wonder like so many conflicts online are like semantics. You ever argued with an alcoholic? Can you please not drink as much? You can't talk to me that way. What way? The way that you're talking to me? I'm not talking to you that way. You're... Don't you turn this around on me. <laughs> you're deflecting. My psychiatrist taught me that word. Take this and this and that. Coroner's like, I wonder why he didn't use his arms to protect himself. And then they find out, apparently that's what she taught him to do. By protecting himself, he was actually initiating violence. <laughs> oh, I see. No, don't worry. It's an eccentricity. I'm sure it never happens. People pulling down people's defenses so they can indulge their predatory nature in order to satisfy an essentially unbalanced way that the libido forms what it calls relationships with other trapped and imprisoned people. <laughs> Yay. And they're not letting... The weird thing is, and I'm not putting this on teachers at all, but, but it's just like the way we teach, we, society, schooling, and I enjoyed my school, I'm very wrong, it's just... It's so inefficient, and it really is not good for the mind. You're not using, really, what you got there. I mean, you could train a monkey to speak English faster. You can train dolphins to fucking speak English before you're going to train a single English person to speak. If by speaking, we also mean, you know, it's a level of breathing. There, When people get into band, they get to play their wind instruments at random more often than I got to make sounds with my own fucking mouth in the entirety of my experience of the English world. So there is a frustration there, absolutely. I mean, I remember writing Valentine's Day's cards in grade one, so I could say, I could write, or they probably had Happy Valentine's Day, and I could write someone's name. So obviously, at some point, by that Valentine's Day in grade one, which gives you, you know, whatever, six months of schooling, Right in the first real like didactic learning that I've done, and I can put people's names in Valentine's Day cards, but I'm not doing any other type of spontaneous or personal level of discourse. You could teach children to write letters by by age seven. I mean, come on. I was in typing, and never once we were asked to write a personal letter to anyone. That's ridiculous. How does that woman feel fulfilled as an instructor of anything? At that time, people were still conducting discourse without email, like, why not teach us how to write a letter? But also, which we probably did write some form letters, but also allow us to write our own letters. Let everyone here write a letter to someone. Wouldn't that be a great use of all of our time and your time? Because that's what good ideas are, a great use of everyone's time. We're here anyway. I remember many, many years later, I was on Salt Spring, and I sat down, and this woman, she was renting this house. She's a white female sociopath, and they always sort of know each other on these islands. She always had a place to live, you know, and it's all about networking, right? And uh, she had this old, partially, I guess, electric typewriter, but it still, like, hit the paper. Boom, boom, boom. 
and I sat down there in a quiet, very peaceful place in the woods, and I just wrote like a like a haiku or just a three or four line poem. We had been walking outside, something about the green pools and the stillness of the water. Nice thing. It was just neat to sit down there for one. It's like I just felt like it was where I was meant to be. Put a little paper in a typewriter, and I just felt one with the universe. But the interesting thing is that this person, this woman, and the people I was around, they didn't read it, and they didn't get it, and they never knew anything about me. They probably didn't even know I was a poet. But they were my friends. I knew lots of things about them, because of course white people always tell you lots about them. They give you their, they give you their resume like every time you're talking. And I'm a good listener. I just want to sit back and appropriately go, wow, you're such an amazing person. I can't wait to see what comes out of you next. That is the perfectly right posture to a white person. And it's nice. But, you know, they won't do the same thing to you. It's a performance, right? In, in rehearsed behavior, what do you have? You have the, the actors and the audience. So a white person always needs an audience. When they're using their personality, the way their relationships carry a kind of tax where one person is always going to be more dominant than the other because there's never really enough of room for both people to breathe in the kind of asphyxiating environment that they've learned to speak, let alone do anything else, according to the days of the week. The days or the dais of the week. What is the dais of the week? The god of the week. The deus of the week. We've got seven days, which is 7-Eleven, which is an even number. What is even is balanced, is rendered imbalanced. This is the action of sickness. Sickness kind of a parasite or a world or just going off balance and hurting you. No. There's little and large levels of imbalance in all sickness and injury, in all world systems, in, in every human reality. Any human can feel imbalances in their world. Is that not correct? Okay. As much as anyone can get sick, but also just you can just energetically feel that something's off. You could feel that this video is off, or I'm off, or a conversation with someone is off, or something about the world is off, or something about your life has just felt a little off for a long time. Injustice could be thinking, right? Things we get that make us angry, all imbalances in the world. A world that in some sense has kind of been knocked off balance. And you have to go off balance in order to get in tune with it. And next thing you know, it carries you off like a stage and the actors are in tune with the language and the vortex of its god and they're carried off into this other realm and we watch them and say ooh amazing tell us all about your adventures in the world we are listening The actor doesn't knows you really well, and you feel like you know the actor, but the actor doesn't come off the stage and sit down beside you and ask you about your life. This communication and this relationship requires a great suspension of disbelief. This is an imbalance in our world and in English culture. But you can see the provenance in something that starts in childhood. So white people are like child soldiers. What loving person would teach them, take 13 years to not teach them how to speak English? And if they're not even speaking English properly and writing it properly, what else has been inhibited? What else are they doing to express themselves? That where their, their breath even knows it has a value being expressed in that way. They'll learn how to put on clothes and look swanky, but will they learn how to robe the thoughts of their spirit? how to feel the song of the sanctity of their own flesh and blood, irrespective of all of the demands of the world around them. Shouldn't we teach them that? Shouldn't we teach them that? Yes, of course we should. Absolutely. Absolutely. We should start that today. 
Get on that. Let's do that. Absolutely. Let it be done. You know? Of course it would be done. Of course we will. How could we not? Those are my thoughts. The ravens are having a good time over there. Talking to So let's, uh, we'll do like a, a little humility session here, you know, um, because I refer to, you know, my qualifications or lack thereof. But these are my opinions. I don't have a degree in anything. I have a couple fizzled out, um, never fully launched careers in community college in the science and arts programs, respectively. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, uh, the quintessential reading of my life, which would be enjoyable to discuss, but does not include by any means uh, anything even remotely close to uh, a sufficient acquaintance with the canon of the English world in any way. So you would, you, would, you would have occasion to wonder if you knew the entire reading list of my life, how I propose to uh, have such strong opinions about a culture I've done so little to ever fully educate myself in. <laughs> so, you know, check mark. Um, I could I could make some defenses to that, but they would be little more than justifications of my own incompetence. So perhaps we'll put that to one side. <laughs> but you know, like how could one? You know, but you know that's a cop out. You could say, <laughs> it's like so. You know, you got me. You know, tell me what my sentence is. Just make sure it's correctly punctuated. I'm gonna call my mom and I'll get back to you. But uh, yeah. They're... Someone's put a pile of stones here eight months ago, and it's kind of nice to actually sit here. And I sit places where the buildings are kind of obscured behind the leaves and stuff, so I can feel more private. And the, you know, the weather is nice in a way that you're not going to find. Rick, will, a nice gentleman, will probably walk down at some point. Uh, we've had a couple deer. Look at those leaves. Oh, isn't that amazing? Huh. You see, nature's life. Nature's nature robes itself, you know, so naturally. When I was in high school, I never was fashionable. I didn't do anything socially appropriate, you would say. Like, I wasn't, wasn't appropriately adjusted. But also, like, fairly to everyone, like, I, I just happened not to take an interest in that or I wasn't good at it. Like, these are things that shouldn't be held against somebody. It rather is, it, it, it holds it, it get itself against you. I hold myself against myself. I hold myself in contempt <laughs> for my lack of adjustment to how to, like, behave like a normal person or wear normal clothes or... You know, people are always going to see that I, I don't really have a, like a, a very strong sense of like the importance as a 50 year old man of looking like a 50 year old man when I walk around in some sense. I mean, I still wear clothes my mom buys me basically. So, I mean, that's <laughs> just tells you everything you need to know. But I, I bear, I, I've worn clothes that all kinds of people have given me or, you know, I, I hardly have to buy my own clothes or I find I've, I've found my best pair of underwear I found lying on the sand beside a river one day. I took it home. I love that. So I've, I've been wearing them for years. They're, I think they're synthetic, so they, they don't break down. It's amazing. So glad. So I know value when I find it. You know what I'm saying? That may not be the moral you get from that story, but that's what I get from it. You know, that's, so it gives you some idea of how I think. You know, Because the most important thing I ever robed myself with was a small book and a film I made in grade 11. And that was, you know, in making stories and satire and jokes and stuff. That, that's what really made me feel like I was, like, I put my life into it because, like, it made it worth being a human being. It resonated strongly with me. Like, this is what I wanted to robe my spirit with. This is something sacred to me. And when you're writing another book and you're robing your spirit in what for you seems like a pretty sacred activity, 
you know, and you're not waiting for someone to tell you. I didn't have any guru in my life or any white person who said, oh, whoever knew I wrote a book, much less, oh, wow, that's a, like a sacred thing in itself. That's, you know, that's part of who you are. I would never want to eliminate that from that. That's, that certainly adds to my sense of you being a valuable person to me. It's never, they'll tell me about someone in their family tree that wrote a book like a hundred years ago or, you know, all things about their whole family's resume, but they don't give a fuck about me writing anything. In fact, I never even bring it up because none of these people are worthy of it. No offense. I mean, it's like my mom told me that most of her life she never took out her teddy bear with any of her roommates, my dad. She didn't take it out until a few years ago. She's had it her whole life. She never felt comfortable enough to take out her teddy bear. And I've had, I've had that experience too actually finding a safe place in the world where I can really make it my own and feel comfortable. So I come out here and kind of, I add to my life by doing that here in a way, so that's a personal need of mine. But that's what I wanted to robe my life with, words. You know? That's where my spirit found life, and I didn't have someone to reinforce that. I didn't have a film teacher who even really, I think, had a spirit. He has a fucking zombie, so he couldn't recognize anything that I was, the enjoyment I was getting out of it at an amateur level. Like, all he could think of was ways to get me to do stuff for him and his teacher friends for free. Editing and filming, which I was useless at for the most part, or help a, a young girl, an actress in his theater program to make a, like a five or six minute application video to Emily Carr, which was just her getting up and falling down dramatically on a stage with some strange music in the background while wearing white, skin-tight leotards. Blonde, blue-eyed, right? It was all about her needs, right? Her career in the art. Was, he never talked to me about my career in art, ever. It didn't come up. So, yeah, yeah. You know, you look back and think, well, you're a little, a lot of people, like teachers live in a pretty small world and you can come through their programs and be a pretty big person, a big talent compared to their little world, you know. Teachers who spend time with people in a time in your life when you're about to launch or, you know, take on your life. People in arts programs, people in a film program, person with a degree in film in his own art school, so-called teacher training, who can't recognize the, the joy or the potential in someone who makes a 45-minute film and spend hundreds and hundreds of hours editing, casting, organizing, funding, writing, um, storyboarding. I had 150 page This film, this is a passionate young man. This man's got a story to what he's doing. He has worked a job that made him cry every day to buy his own equipment to do this. He wrote this film on a computer that some unknown woman gave to his family. Otherwise, he wouldn't have even bothered. The first thing he ever did, the first thing he ever wrote was this film. Ever. I sat down and wrote a film. Because I wanted to. It sounded like fun, and I felt, without anyone teaching me, that I might have something to say. And it was a film relevant, what, to my entire family psychology. I then went on to write a book three years later, relevant to my entire family psychology, and no one, I couldn't get a fucking person to take an interest in it, you know that? Never even mentioned it to my therapist. We never got that close, to be honest with you, because right away you could see what their intentions were, it had nothing to do with me whatsoever. And it's like, you know what, you, you white people, you white motherfuckers have to learn some fucking personal manners. <laughs> You gotta go find some fucking war. Go to the fucking North Pole, plant a flag, put it on your fucking resume. And then while you're up there, get some fucking warmth from under the biggest fucking glacier you can find and stick that in your craw. So I don't fucking turn to an icicle when I'm spending time with someone who's supposed to fucking help me. <laughs>